compañeros de la empresa Andera Instrument, eh, que pertenece al grupo Sainem, que es una de las empresas que también con más años de experiencia en el sector. Eh, llevan más de 40 años de, dedicados a la instrumentación oceanográfica y continúan eh, sacando productos novedosos y, y con gran presencia en el mercado. Entonces nos acompañará Andes Tenberg para hacer una, un par de presentaciones sobre trabajos realizados con productos de Andera y también una pequeña introducción o un repaso histórico a lo que ha sido la instrumentación que ha ido produciendo eh, esta compañía. Bueno, en lo que se refiere a, a SIDMAR, pues nos quedamos en, hace ahora ya 20 años, en octubre del 95. Inicialmente nos constituimos eh, con una vocación investigadora en el marco de un proyecto de investigación de unos procesos de intrusión marina a través de, de unas cuevas en la, en la provincia de Alicante y como resultado de, de esos proyectos de investigación creamos la empresa y nos vimos unos años más tarde eh, abocados a continuar con esa actividad empresaria. Pero los primeros años nos dedicamos a la consultoría marina, sobre todo hacíamos estudios de... nos enfocamos más hacia lo que es la parte de, de, de física marina, y procesos costeros, entonces dejando un poquito de lado la parte de la biología porque había más competencia en, en ese sector y nos dedicamos pues a hacer estudios de corriente, de oleaje, transportes de, de sedimentos, eh, modelización, o hacer uso de modelos como el Gormis para hacer simulaciones de, de donde iban a ir vertidos de salmuera o de, o de, de, de plumas de fluidez, etc. ¿no? Luego tuvimos la oportunidad de empezar a representar alguna firma de instrumentación. Empezamos, la primera empresa con la que trabajamos fue Sontec. Empezamos a, a, a vender productos de esa empresa y esto nos llevó digamos, a crear una línea de negocio que era la instrumentación marina. En, poco a poco fuimos creciendo en ese sector también y fuimos manteniendo en paralelo la actividad de la consultoría marina y la instrumentación marina. Poco a poco fuimos consiguiendo nuevas firmas hasta un total de veintipico empresas que estamos representando actualmente. Y también, pues, eh, en los inicios de la empresa tuvimos la oportunidad de empezar a trabajar en proyectos de oceanografía operacional, en lo que son prestación de servicios de mantener operativos, equipos de medida, que están ofreciendo datos en tiempo real a instituciones, pues, en este caso, puertos del Estado. Entonces, ahí nuestra misión era no solo el suministro de los equipos, sino el mantener operativos todos estos equipos, encargarnos de que los equipos estén mandando datos cada hora, al cliente final, que es el que genera los productos que pone a disposición del público y bueno, pues ha sido una línea de negocio importante, ¿no? Durante estos años hemos mantenido la red de boyas de oleaje direccional de puertos del Estado, también mantenemos la red de mareógrafos de puertos del Estado, la red MAR y pequeñas redes de otras eh, entidades como por ejemplo SOCIP, colaboramos con ellos, tanto en el suministro como en darles soporte técnico y ese tipo de cosas. Así que bueno, Actualmente, a pesar de la crisis, mantenemos estas tres líneas de negocio más o menos a la par. Ahora está la cosa flojilla, pero bueno, se va cambiando el temporal. Mantenemos la línea de consultoría, la línea de instrumentación marina y la línea de servicios operacionales. Y también una incipiente eh, I más D, en proyectos de I más D. Y bueno, pues eso es en términos generales lo que, a lo que nos dedicamos actualmente en la empresa. Voy a dar paso entonces a, a mi colega y amigo Ander Stenberg de Andera Instrument, que tiene dos, dos charlas preparadas para, para que conozcáis mejor la potencialidad de los instrumentos de esta empresa noruega. Uh, so, uh, <coughs> espero que, que pueda hacerlo en inglés porque um, mi castellano no es bueno, porque eh, por eso creo que es mejor para ustedes también si es en inglés. So <coughs> this presentation will be a little bit about uh, measuring with different types of instrumentation and the type of uh, work you can do in uh, different types of, uh, of situations. Uh, I, come, uh, I work both uh, part-time at university in Gothenburg as an um, um, associate professor and uh, also as a scientific advisor and product manager. I work at the company Andera in Norway since uh, 1997. The company has installed many different uh, instruments and uh, it spans over almost 17,000 meters. The highest installations are meteorological stations at about 6,000 meters 
above sea level and the lowest we have uh, delivered are for trench work, so 11,000 meters in deep. Uh, just a compulsory slide about uh, uh, the group we belong to. We belong to a group of companies which is called Xylem. Xylem is the system that transports water in trees. Uh, in, and uh, the, this name comes from Greek. And it's American-owned controlled group. And uh, we belong to... This. It's a large group with about 12,000 employees. We belong to part of Xylem, which is called Analytics. All these companies deal with water in some way. The biggest company in the brand is uh, Flykt, which is a Swedish company making pumps, water pumps for, for example, the water treatment plants. But we belong to analytics, and here we do sensors and different systems to analyze water for, uh, for different components, like SI analytics are doing titrators, for example, for different, uh, different things. Uh, these are doing refractometers for, uh, for water. The companies we work closest to it are uh, YSI, Sontek and Andera, because we are making sensors for measuring in natural waters. We are more focused on oceanographic applications, Sontek is more coastal and inland waters and YSI is also inland waters and, and coastal. <coughs> uh, so Jose Maria asked me to say some words about the history of the company but I thought I could say also some words about oceanography in Scandinavia and the history, because it's, it's quite long history for in oceanographic work in, in Scandinavia. And that also uh, has given a strong industry in, uh, in, um, in um, uh, oceanographic uh, sensor development. Here are two of the first scientists that worked, started to do some oceanographic studies you know the Celsius scale, under Celsius was, uh, uh, came up with this scale and he started to do some measurements in, in water, so with, with thermometers. Uh, uh, someone who was very <laughs> active in uh, biology and biological oceanography, not so much by himself, but by sending students all around the world was Carl von Linné, who did this uh, Syste Systema Natura. I don't know what your background is, biological or physical or... Chemical. Uh, I don't know exactly. You're from Marine different. Marine science. Sorry. Marine science. Marine science. So you have uh, yes. Mm -hmm. I guess most of you have heard about Carl von Linnaeus, Carl Linnaeus or Carl von Linnaeus, who did this Systema Natura. He said himself, God created. He was religious. I classified. So he made a classification of animals and so. On. But he sent uh, he sent his students uh, around the world for different expeditions. Many of them died in their expeditions, uh, but here are some results from them. This guy here, Peter Forskål, he went for, this, for ex several expeditions. He developed primitive methods to take water samples at different depths. He measured salinity and temperature by drying, salinity by drying and weighing, and temperature, and he collected algae, zooplankton, fish, on a voyage to Yemen, and he classified many of the Red Sea fishes. Another one, Sparman, another Sparman, took water samples and measured temperature during three of, of Cook's expeditions and classified plants and animals. And then they sent all these results back to the master, which was Linné. If we move a little bit forward to a meeting in Stockholm in 1899, you don't see it so well here, but there, here are three of the major people in, uh, in oceanographic work. It was uh, uh, Ekman, you heard of maybe Ekman Spiral, uh, it was Otto Pettersson, and it was uh, Fritjof Nansen. Uh, I don't know if you heard about Fritjof Nansen, was polar explorer and a very good scientist as well. So they formed in uh, 1899, they came inis initiated uh, this <coughs> formation of ISIS, International Council for Exploration of the Sea, which was then established in 1902. And they did a lot of instrument development uh, during that time. Otto Pettersson, for example, he started together with uh, Nansen to develop this. He started himself, but then Nansen uh, came in and uh, helped him to develop these uh, isolated water bottles in uh, the late uh, 1800s. And here is Nansen during the Arctic drift with Fram, where they tried to drift over the pole, the North Pole, but didn't manage, and uh, Nansen and another guy set off by ski, and they came back one and a half years later, having stayed in, on an island in between. 
uh, and uh, here it takes make measurements and take water samples with these bottles and they were further developed and further uh, improved with isolation and reverse thermometers and stuff like this. Uh, Otto Peterson worked on uh, recording current meters and here is one of the first they did uh, which really you can see here really recorded time series of currents. You can see here the tidal ellipses here and they were based on, on a photographic film taking photos. So they could record for about two weeks or so and uh, give information. And then we have, they also constructed these internal wave riders and recorded the first internal wave, or did the first internal wave study. So they were kind of neutrally buoyant and were riding on internal waves in, uh, in some fjords. <coughs> And then, uh, yes, one of, of the students here was uh, Rosby. He was in atmospheric, but maybe you heard of these Rosby waves, which is also have implications for, for, uh, for oceanographic uh, applications. Thomas Rosby is, I think it's the grandson of Arv Gust Carl Gustav uh, Rosby, who he is working at University of Rhode Island in, uh, in the US. And Ekman, uh, the Ekman spiral, he did um, develop the uh, did further development of current meters and try different devices and uh, here are some other optical thing optical instruments which were developed later in the 1940s with uh, with light bulbs and uh, transmission meters a big uh, very big devices reflection uh, transmission meters and and stuff like that so th there is a quite long history in this <coughs> if we move into what uh, our company is doing we don't have this long history but we started in 1966 as a NATO project where the founder of the company Ivar Andra developed the first mechanical current meters uh, you can see a picture here <coughs> and uh, they revolutionized uh, current measurements because for the first time you could put an instrument down and uh, which was Quite, which was reliable and you could put it down for a year or almost two years and measure currents for example in Antarctica or in the Arctic at the same time other sensors were added like uh, temperature and uh, salinity and then you can see the development here as the years have been going by from uh, more solid state instruments the first one had a tape and a tape recorder these are more solid state uh, instruments and here first acoustic profiler in 1994 single point acoustic instruments <coughs> going to deep waters in 2000, a more advanced acoustic profiler in 2003, and uh, a multi-parameter recorder called Seaguard in 2007. And here is some more instrument going back to something which is just dedicated to, to current measurements and for shallow water, which is called RCM Blue. And uh, then the latest profiler, which is called Seaguard 2, which has capabilities of adding sensors from <coughs> many different different manufacturers or strings of sensors and uh, you can uh, put two one Doppler current sensor measuring upwards and another one measuring downwards simultaneously so you can it's a it's a lot of flexibility taking advantage of of the new development in electronics and that uh, the instruments uh, that we manufacture are quite robust. You can see if you go around and visit many of the oceanographic institutes around the world, you can will still see many of these in use. Or they are in use or they are in the warehouses, but there are many, many of these that still are, are uh, being used. And that's why we have kept many of the form factors and the, the parts. That's why we can offer trade-in if, if people want to upgrade to a fully modern high quality instrument they can trade in and use for example the pressure cases and the parts of the instruments and get a, a modern uh, instrument with uh, the, the latest measuring technology. Um, the Seaguard I told you about it's a multi-parameter logger uh, it's not only a current meter uh, we have moved away from just traditional uh, single current uh, instruments to something which can do much more and here is one example of this this is uh, one single instrument a sea guard to which you can connect many sensors and uh, 
in nodes. The length of this cable here was, is 300 meters. It's uh, laid out on coral reefs in Florida by divers and at each of these nodes here okay yeah there is uh, at each of these nodes there is uh, oxygen and temperature and uh, one of these sensors is installed inside the outlet of a giant sponge which lives on the reefs which are uh, quite important for the coral reef ecology and the other sensor is put outside and by measuring the difference in oxygen you get the respiration rates of the of the sponges and by looking at how the sponges and the reef responds over time periods of a year or two years to changes in waves, to runoff from land, particle input and so, you can use the sponges as uh, an ecological um, uh, indicator of how the coral reef is responding to different environmental changes. And so you see uh, there are sensors connected here and there are sensors connected here. This is a Doppler current sensor, it's a salinity, here's a turbidity for particles. Here is a wave and tide and here is probably another oxygen sensor maybe. So this was one of the first string systems we delivered about 10 years ago. The latest we delivered was installed two weeks ago in Antarctica. <coughs> and here you can see how it's built up. Uh, here the cable is one kilometer long. Uh, first to install this they uh, have to drill through 400 meters of ice with hot water. This is a project between uh, University of Bergen and British Antarctic Survey. So they drill through the ice 400 meters and then they let this string of sensors and instruments go through. You have here a sea guard instrument and going down here you have nodes measuring currents, oxygen, salinity and uh, pressure and then it's relayed to a unit up here which has iridium communication so you can see data online immediately <coughs> after this is, is installed uh, the hole is freezing, freezing and you cannot do anything anymore so the goal is to have this installed for many years and to go down in Antarctica and change batteries every year <coughs> so if we look at <coughs> our tradition of making current meters, if we look at how does these current meters compare with other current meters, the best way to compare, of course if you're a manufacturer you want other people to compare so you get independent tests of how your instruments are working. And here are some examples of this where our Seaguard single point current meter, it's measuring currents in one, in one point acoustically how it's compared to other instruments and here are some institutes that have compared the instruments and uh, uh, for example the latest studies have been uh, by University of Miami and University of Rhode Island uh, and for example both of these were at 4000 meters depth this one here was uh, uh, for 11 months in the Drake Passage where there was quite high currents and a lot of movement and tilt because different instruments have different abilities to handle tilt. Our instruments send out, the single point instruments we have, they send out an acoustic signal in four directions simultaneously. It's reflected against particles which moves in the water. And you select the two um, transducers which look upstream, so you don't get disturbance. Downstream of an instrument you have turbulence, but if you select the upstream, you don't get disturbance from your instrument itself. So it selects the upstream part and then it uh, used the Doppler shift to measure this. Uh, this is quite well known now for all the most acoustic instruments. The advantage of having horizontally facing transducers is if your mooring is moving and if your instrument is tilting, you have the ability to compensate for this tilt and, uh, and movement if you have, as we have, an accelerometer inside which all the time senses how the instrument is moving and a free axis compass which can take any type of movement. If you have an instrument with upward looking transducers, if one of these transducers is facing straight up, there will be no Doppler shift from the horizontal current. This means Doppler shift will be zero from the horizontal current and then that will introduce a large error in your calculations. <coughs> <coughs> The result, if you summarize all these independent tests by different institutes, 
was that uh, the Seaguard instrument was the most reliable. It returned 100% data in all the tests and had the longest autonomy because it has large battery capacity and low energy consumption. It gave the highest data quality with the lowest noise of all the acoustic current meters and it was the only instrument that could handle high tilts. Other instruments with upward looking transducers handle about 20 degrees tilt. This instrument can handle about 50 degrees tilt and there is a paper for example, a recent paper here. There are many papers here but a recent paper which is describing the test which was done in Drake Passage if you're interested in that. <coughs> But if you really want to have an independent test of how well your current meter is working, you can compare instruments with each other. You can compare propeller instruments with an acoustic instrument, with a time travel acoustic instrument, with an electro uh, electromagnetic instrument. But you will always have discussion. Was the mooring <coughs> moving? Were they measuring in the same water mass? Was, uh, was the data representative? The only uh, absolute way of referencing your instrument is to take them into a tow tank. So you tow your instrument at a certain speed and the trolley here normally has an absolute accuracy of one millimeter per second, so it's much better one than what these instruments can do. The problem with doing acoustic instrument tow tank tests is that you have reflections in the walls and the water is quite clear, so it ha it's difficult to make these tests. And we had difficulties for several years to, to get good test data. But we found a, a tow tank in China where they didn't filter the water for 30 years. So it was dirty enough to get, uh, get uh, good, uh, good data. And then it should looks like this, where you have the speed of the trolley, which is the absolute reference, and the speed which the instrument is given here. And you can see that there is a good correlation. At lower speeds, there can be some differences be because if you try to make a tow tank test at five centimeters per second, you know, five centimeters is very slow speed. And if you uh, try to make a tow tank test at that slow speed, you, <coughs> you might have uh, issues because there is internal circulation in your tank. And if you make one tow, you need to wait for quite a long time before you make the next, the next tow. So our instruments, on our instruments you can put sensors. It's plug and play, you saw the long strings, uh, you add the sensor, you turn off the power, you add the new sensor, you turn on the power, uh, and the sensor is ready to uh, measure and to be logged by, by the instrument. When we, when we talk about smart sensor, this is what we imply. It's a sensor which has an internal processor where calibration coefficients are stored, and they all have a temperature sensor included on board. Because if you measure CO2, if you measure oxygen, if you measure wave and tide or pressure, you need to measure temperature in parallel and compensate for the variations in temperature. So they all include a high quality temperature sensor. And they give out absolute values. If you look at oxygen, for example, the optical oxygen sensor, uh, you have oxygen in, in uh, absolute concentration in micromolar, in percent saturation, and you have temperature data, and then you have raw data if you would like to have that. The way these sensors communicate when you connect them to our systems, the long strings and so, you use a kind of industrial bus, CAN bus, it's called, or it's based on CAN bus, but you can also take them off your instrument and use them directly connected to your computer in the lab for lab experiments, or you can <coughs> connect them to another type of data logger as long as they can ten take this kind of standard input, serial input. Uh, some new uh, things here is PCO2. It's something uh, we are selling under contract now. We, we have worked on this for about five or six years. It takes a long time to develop a new sensor technology. It's a lot of things that can happen and you want to have them tested in many, as many different situations as possible and understand when something goes wrong, why it went wrong, and wh what you should do to, <coughs> to try to avoid it in the future. We have since, this is not so new, but it's something we have since uh, a couple of years back. It's uh, uh, oxygen calibration with a 40-point calibration, which gives uh, a very high accuracy, and also 12,000 meter rated sensors we have as, as optional. And uh, 
We have worked on further development of our pressure sensors, which are big like this, and uh, that gives uh, high accuracy and uh, very low drift over time. Uh, you can use a sensor like this, which is 6,000 meter rated. You can put it at 5,000 meter depth, and you will see, of course, how the tides are changing, and uh, if your mooring is moving. If you filter that out, you can see how air pressure is changing at the surface. So you can measure air pressure variations at the surface from 5,000 meters uh, depth with a sensor like that. Because the resolution is high, and because the stability is good, and because uh, <coughs> the accuracy is, uh, is good. And uh, the latest of our smart sensors is the current profiler sensor. Also, you can connect to our instruments, one upward looking, for example, and one downward looking. Or you can connect to another type of logger if you would like to that or like to do that or to to uh, to a computer. <coughs> um, so our sensors are standalone, and here are examples of how they are used by others. This is from uh, IFM GMR in Kiel. They have online systems at a couple of locations. Here you can see uh, the locations and. Uh, uh, the way they are online is that they have inductive communication, so it goes through a cable, inductive communication of data through the cable, and then to a surface modem, which is floating at the surface, and transmits data back over Iridium satellite. So that's how you get the data back to, to, um, to the, or you, that's how you get the data to the internet, you can say. Uh, and here is uh, devices which are constructed by a German company named Devilogic, which we have a lot of collaboration with. And you see here how they integrate our sensors, in this case pressure, conductivity, oxygen, and a current Doppler current sensor. And here, this is the inductive part, where you have communication through inductive link. <coughs> Another integration of our sensors is in this here. This is a, a, a project which is focusing on biology in the deepest trenches in the world oceans. Hadal, um, I don't know if you heard about Hadal, but Hadal means trench, trenches. And uh, here they integrate our Doppler current sensors and oxygen sensors in the project. So they send down landers with baits and they want to study uh, the activity, if there is fish or what kind of macroorganisms there is and uh, how active they are. And here is photographs from 7,000 meters. Here is photographs from 7,500. Here you see a bait. Below 8,000 meters, as far as I know, they didn't find any fish. They just find these amphipods. And this is a really big amphipods, which comes and, uh, and attacks and eats uh, everything which falls to the, to the seafloor. And they measure currents. <coughs> and here you can see current measurements from one of these lander deployments measured with a Doppler current sensor sitting underneath here. So when we first looked at this data and uh, they came back to us, they asked us, do you think this is, is this not a problem with the Doppler current sensor? You see, of course, the tidal oscillations here. And you see the direction of the currents. But the absolute number seems to be too high. You know, if you measure currents in the deep sea at the abyssal plane, typically you will find something like five, five to ten centimeters speed of currents. But uh, here they found speeds like 30 centimeters per second, 40 centimeters per second. So we checked the sensor, couldn't find anything wrong with it. But, uh, but, uh, and we couldn't really conclude on if this was good or not. But when I visited. Another institute involved in this project, which is called Yamstek in Japan, we lo I looked at their videos. They don't have the current sensors yet on their landers, but I looked at videos from this trench. And you can see on the videos how particles were moving and resuspending. So, uh, and particles typically with this type of sediments start resuspending at 30 to 40 centimeters per second. Uh, so uh, here it looked quite uh, realistic after that. And uh, uh, this photographs and data is courtesy of Alan Jameson at Ocean Lab in Aberdeen. <coughs> so we have <coughs> sorry, we have developed <coughs> uh, oxygen, optical oxygen sensors and uh, 
we were the first to develop these sensors and make them commercially available for oceanographic applications. They were available before that for medical applications, and that's the way it often goes. Uh, when sensors are developed, uh, the technology is developed within medical science because there is much more funding there, and there it goes maybe a little bit faster, and then uh, someone thinks maybe we could use that in oceanographic applications as well and then it goes to oceanographic applications. So we developed this type of sensors and uh, we first launched them in 2002 and uh, it's, I think it's fair to say that these have revolutionized the way oxygen is measured because for the first time you could really measure oxygen for long-term periods with stability of the sensors. Earlier sensors were, ma were electrochemical and they are typically stable for maybe uh, one month, two months maximum, something like this. And here are some applications. There is more than 60 publications where these sensors are used. Here is, for example, ferry boxes measuring in the surface water. On Argo floats, uh, these are autonomous floats moving up and down. Are you all familiar with this type of devices? <coughs> so they are moving up and down and making profiles in the water column. And uh, for the, f the first people who put optodes on these were on a Kurtzinger <laughs> and his group in, from Germany. And uh, this resulted in, in several yeah, nature papers and science papers. And uh, here you see results from the Labrador Sea, and where they could s prove that the inmixing of oxygen, uptake of oxygen in the Labrador Sea was, was much, much higher uh, than what the model was forecasting. So again, uh, the um, utility of having sensors and being able to measure parameters in the sea. Uh, here is an application which maybe you are not so familiar with, with Familiar with it's called hyperoheic. It means that sensors, it's about riverbed studies. So people bury the sensors in the riverbed and they let them measure there for one year at a time, something like this, to study the oxygen variations in the riverbeds. This is related to fish and to salmon spawning. So these are projects mainly from, uh, from Scotland, these publications here. Gradient measurements, if you put sensors on several levels above the seafloor or at an interface, you will get a gradient. And with this gradient, you can calculate production or consumption. And this has been done in several papers. Here is one by McGillis and colleagues who studied the the metabolic rates of coral reefs and where they could see, for example, the sensors closest to the seafloor. During daytime you have production of oxygen, benthic primary production at the seafloor, so oxygen levels were higher at the seafloor, lower higher up, and during nighttime it changed with more consumption at the seafloor and production <laughs> and higher values higher up. Another type, another study like this was done by uh, Champignois and Borch who measured on uh, seagrass meadow of Corsica for three years and measured the metabolic rates for the, of the seagrass. And they could see how it was changing over, over seasons, over months, over years. Uh, applications where you put them on <coughs> coastal measuring systems like uh, buoys. Uh, here is mooring applications where they have sea gods on moorings on several levels. And in this case, it's a project which is looking at this large, large eddies which is forming in the oxygen minimum zones. And when the, you have, have them also in Caverda, I think, when they are moving through, you would have a, a very significant drop in oxygen, as you can see here. This is off the coast of Peru, and you can see here our oxygen drops from about 80% saturation down to 10% saturation when such a large eddy is moving through the area. There is much lower oxygen inside the eddy because uh, uh, nothing comes in and there is organic concentration of organic material in the middle. Gliders, uh, many of uh, optodes are used on gliders. Here in this case it was to study the primary production for a nine month deployment Cable CTD deployments, here is an example from Hiroshi Ushida and colleagues from Yamstec, where they uh, did a lot of studies on the performance of the sensors 
they used 11 sensors and lowered them many times to, to 6,000 meters. And as reference, they took 8,000 samples and analyzed them for Winkler. So it's a good, uh, good reference. They also suggested in this paper ways of uh, improving uh, pressure compensation and ways of, uh, of better calculating the oxygen, which we have implemented into the sensors. Gas exchange chambers and incubators. Here are some specific incubators where you, for example, incubate deep sea fish. You capture deep sea fish and measure the metabolic rates of deep sea fish. So these are just some examples of where these sensors have been used. Why <coughs> they have become so widely used is mainly because of the long-term stability. There are about 100 examples of where these sensors have been in the field, mainly on the Argo floats, for more than six years without any signs of drift. And uh, other factors which play a role here it's that they do not consume oxygen, they are good for hot water monitoring, they have low fouling sensitivity, not sensitive to, uh, most, to, most, to, to chemicals, any chemicals we know of that exist in natural waters. Uh, they have high accuracy if they are well calibrated. Uh, our sensors don't, do not have any irreversible pressure effects, what you call pressure hysteresis, but that depends on type of foil you have. So some sensors might have that, optical sensors might have that. And they are not freezing sensitive. For example, people have used them in Arctic, Antarctic projects and let them freeze into the ice and see what happens with the gas. <coughs> if you look at the development that you do at the company of sensors, since we first launched these sensors in 2002 until uh, we upgraded them, seriously upgraded them in 2012, you can see... Uh, uh, even if they look very similar, there is significant improvements in the sensor technology from the first models to, to the later models. There is better electronics, better optics. Uh, we introduced a red reference LED in this, which gives better stability in the readings and also better ability to do a multipoint calibration, better temperature compensation <coughs> and better formulas to calculate absolute oxygen which were suggested by this guy here, uh, the paper I showed you by Hiroshi Yoshida and colleagues. And we also have introduced this multi-point calibration system, which gives you higher accuracy. And also in 2013, we introduced this 100 meter rated uh, sensor, which is a much lower price and it's targeting mainly aquaculture or so. But the quality is still the same as, as for the higher end mod models here. But the depth rating is not. That's good. The way you calibrate the sensor like this, or the way we calibrate the sensors, it's, it has to be done at the company, it has to be done in, in a more or less automatic or standardized way. And we have here <coughs> a fully automat automatic system where you change the oxygen concentration using mass flow controllers. So you have, to, you have a mix of gas and you use the mass flow controllers to mix the gas and then you get different concentrations. It's an automatic system. You can see a double, it's a double glass wall and with temperature control outside. So you start it, it automatically makes a 40 point calibration. That's eight different temperatures and five different concentrations. And after that, it makes a 20 point check of, uh, of the calibration. And that takes about two days, but it runs by itself. We have it running now since two and a half years. For referencing, we use three optodes, uh, but these have been calibrated by an independent institute uh, and using Winkler titrations. And then regularly we take out water samples and analyze them by Winkler titration, which is the absolute reference for oxygen, and using here a system from another asylum company, SI Analytics. <coughs> and we, as the only company, we participate in this international intercomparison where sensors are sent around and calibrated at different uh, calibration facilities and uh, compared the, how the different facilities are doing is compared. And this is supposed to be summarized now. <coughs> I haven't seen the results yet, but it's the, yeah, the Germans are supposed to make a summary of this. And uh, with this system, we get an absolute accuracy. This is the field accuracy, which is these numbers here, 1.5% or 2.5 micromolar. <coughs> The optical oxygen, optical sensors, oxygen or PCO2 or, or pH, they are not linear. 
this is an a disadvantage and that you show here you show here is the temperature dependence and here is the raw data coming from the sensor and here is the absolute here is the concentration in oxygen and you can see it's not linear that and here you see the calibration points from the 40 point calibration the advantage is if you make a 40 point calibration like this you get a good temperature you get the, the the high accuracy over the whole field of temp or over, over the whole range of oxygen and temperature and here is the residuals so this is after the calibration is done the system is checking how is the sensor performing after the calibration and uh, this is the value the sensor gives minus the reference value and the red here is the specifications we give and as you can see we try to give conservative specifications which should be related to the accuracy you get in the field not what you get in the lab just after the sensor is calibrated so to pass the sensor needs to be much better than the specifications <coughs> we give for the sensor so based let me see I think now it's about 40 minutes shall we take uh, it's Five minutes, ten or fifteen minutes break or so. Mm. That is fine. Huh? Yes. Think that's good. Yeah. yeah. You, you have a second uh, <coughs> presentation. Yeah, it's a little bit about PCO two and, and pH and about applications, gliders, uh, ferry box. Okay. Um, yeah. Or shall uh, do you want to continue, or you think it's uh, are you too tired? Yes, we continue with the last one. Yeah, yeah, you can continue. Okay. So, <coughs> so um, we started. We got gained experience for 15 years with the oxygen optodes, and I must must say, as a company, when you develop, we develop these oxygen optodes. We have sold uh, many, many thousands of them. Still today, we, some, we discover new things with them, things which we didn't really realize and uh, w which maybe sometimes we don't understand fully. So it's a continuous development. And the more people want to measure in details, the more uh, things yeah, you, need to be, you need to take into account. But with experience of the oxygen, we uh, have also tried to develop uh, optical PCO2 sensors and that's more tricky than the oxygen and uh, this uh, main main work to test and uh, do further development of these sensors were done by a PhD students of ours Darya Tamashuk who is now in Canada working with Doug Wallace and uh, so and within the frames of a European project named SenseNet <coughs> here again you see calibration curve of a PCO2 sensor you can see how it's not linear the same as for the oxygen and uh, but and they are more difficult to calibrate uh, but the advantage once you have done a multi-point calibration is that if they go out of calibration you can adjust this whole curve just by a single single reference measurement <coughs> and uh, these have been used in uh, many different applications uh, from coastal waters to aquaculture to fish transport to gliders to ferry boxes to yeah <laughs> many different applications and we are now selling these sensors under kind of contract where we give special support uh, because yeah they are uh, they, these sensors have some uh, difficulties they are not so straightforward as the oxygen and uh, you need to know what you're doing when you work when you work with the uh, with the oxygen octodes but here is an example of a result from uh, these sensors measuring over a time period of seven months you can see here in red this is in a fjord on the Swedish west coast at an observatory that we are running since three years back or four years back you can see in red uh, PCO2 the partial pressure of CO2 how it's varying over a time period of seven months from September to April and in blue you see the oxygen so they are sitting on one of these sea guard strings back to back and as you would expect there is a reverse correlation between the two and here below you see salinity in uh, in uh, purple and temperature in green <coughs> 
But if you really want to understand what, what processes do you have here in the fjord, you cannot just look at the relation between the partial pressure of CO2 and the oxygen. You need to convert CO2 to the to total carbonate. Because the total carbonate is, uh, is reflect, you know, when algae is growing, uh, they need a certain amount of carbon and they produce a certain amount of, of oxygen according to red field ratio. And uh, so if you want to compare on molar ratios oxygen with the carbon which is consumed or produced, you need to convert to total carbonate, or often also called DIC, dissolved inorganic carbon. And to do this, you need another parameter of the carbonate system, which in this case we took alkalinity, because by establishing a relation between salinity and alkalinity, which we measure, salinity we measure continuously on our observatory at many levels, uh, we can uh, get alkalinity from the salinity. And by using alkalinity and PCO2, we can calculate the total carbonate. And this can be compared on a molar ratio with the oxygen. So when you compare this on a molar ratio, we have plot, it's plotted here, the same graph, but you should note here now that the total carbonate is on a reverse scale and the relative scaling between these two scales, between the oxygen and the total carbonate, is according to red field ratio, which is approximately 1.3. This means that when the red curve, which is the total carbonate, and the blue, which is oxygen, are parallel, biological processes are dominating. So in the autumn here, when organic material is breaking down, uh, bacteria, by bacteria, biology is dominating and these curves are approximately parallel. In the winter, autumn and winter, where we have mixing, for example here there was a storm and we have air sea exchange, typically what you see then is a, a large jump in oxygen, there is ventilation of oxygen, the ventilation of oxygen goes much faster than the response of the carbonate system. And this is typically what you have when you have air sea exchange. And then in the winter you have mixing, advection and mixing. And then comes the spring with the spring bloom. And again you can see the curves are parallel. Again biology is dominating. And here we have the algae growing, producing uh, oxygen and consuming carbon in the water to, uh, to become algae. And by using, for example, this, you can calculate how much is the primary production rate, so we'll compare it with one year to another and do different estimates and calculations. <coughs> so uh, we have uh, these studies <coughs> were from our observatory, which we are running at, in the Collifjord, and data is online here. We have at the bottom an acoustic profiler. Here is Seagard with a string with a lot of sensors on it. <coughs> um, here it looks like this when it's in the fjord it's, uh, and it looks like this when it's laid out on the deck this is just a sea guard with a string it's a short string to start with we were using this before we started to use it online we used it autonomously for half a year mm -hmm. at a time with some sensors connected to it Doppler current sensor salinity, wave and tide oxygen and temperature and uh, yeah, salinity later on we have added for test purposes and for scientific purposes like optical pH, optical CO2 and, uh, and every time you get temperature. And here you see from a paper which hopefully soon will come out from uh, these studies uh, how you can combine different, different parameters. You see this is the acoustic reflections from, uh, from the acoustic profiler. Uh, you can see how spring bloom is coming and how you have more reflections and uh, it's sinking down. Before that you have migration of zooplankton in the water column which continues all through the spring and uh, the autumn. You have uh, here the spring bloom with the boosting of the oxygen and the consumption of carbon at two different levels. And here is a chlorophyll sensor from another company in the group, YSI, uh, indicating the same, that you have a spring bloom here and this is light light measured at the same same place par and here is these red field ratios at different levels and different years they should be the relation should be 1.3 but 
but it was between 1.1 and 1.6. Because probably maybe it's not exactly as Redfield described it, or we have other things coming in and, uh, and playing a role here. For example, the mixing of water advection. <coughs> if we look at oxygen data from our observatory, uh, we measure oxygen at, at multiple levels here with the string. And you can see it's quite variable in the fjord. At the bottom we have hydrogen sulfide, anoxic conditions with hydrogen sulfide, so zero oxygen. You should notice <coughs> the location we have selected here. We selected it because it's a sampling location for Swedish Metrological and Hydrographic Institute. They go here every month and take samples, reference samples, and they have done so for the last 30 years or 40 years. So we get here for free every month a reference sample taken by them, high quality, analyzed by Winkler titration. And we can com compare that with our data. The, these data are available about one, two months after the expedition and then we assimilate them into our plots. And here you see examples of, this is just uh, half a year of measurements, but you can see here reference data from five meters from SMHI, measurement data from four meters, you can see the spring bloom here that is boosting oxygen and creating supersaturation, oversaturation in the surface waters and how that corresponds also to the reference data. Here you can see typical effects of fouling on the sensor foil. This is benthic algae which sits on the foil and is consuming and producing... Oh, thank you. So it's con during night it's consuming oxygen, during daytime it's producing uh, oxygen. So here you see typical fouling effects and uh, the reference samples is not following that. Another thing you should notice is that from uh, these blue diamonds here are from 20 meters reference sampling and the light blue one is from 22 meters. You can see that they track well until you get oxygen saturation concentrations about 20% below or 20% saturation. Then there is more and more difference between the two. We think this is due to contamination from uh, the water sampling bottles. On all, oceanographic, on all oceanographic ships, they use Niskin bottles, which are of plastic. Plastic dissolves a lot of gas. And if you're working in a zone with low oxygen concentrations, if you're lowering your plastic bottle, which has dissolved a lot of gas into low oxygen water and close it and let it and it takes half an hour before you empty your samples you will have contamination and that's why we see these differences here we think you don't see the difference when oxygen concentration is zero because then it's a lot of hydrogen sulfide in the water which is effect effectively removing the oxygen and there are papers describing this but People working in the oxygen minimum zones, for example, seems to ignore this. Or even oceanograph oceanographers working at deep water, where it takes one hour to go down, close the bottle, and one hour to get back up. Automatically, you will have a co contamination. I'm sure <coughs> this is the case. And here is a paper which describes the contamination from plastic materials, but not in the context of oceanographic applications, but in the context of of uh, bacterial incubations and you can see PVC is here which is used in the in the Niskin bottles. We can also see it in our experiments. Uh, we have done experiments on this and we see it clearly that plastics give memory effects and have contamination issues. <coughs> um, the PCU2 sensor we used in, as I told you, in, in many different applications, and here is one. You know, it's uh, to counterbalance the greenhouse effects and the release of all the CO2 that we are sending out into the atmosphere. There is talks about can we store CO2 below the seafloor, and uh, there are, this is already done in Norway, for example. But that it's more from the aspect to increase the pressure in the pumps in the in the wells. But uh, here was a dedicated project where a hole was drilled through the bedrock and CO2 was released from bottles <coughs> below 10 millimeters below the sediment water interface. And the project was aiming to study ecological effects of this release, 
Can you detect the release with sensors? Of course, if you have the bubbles like this, you can detect, but sometimes you don't have uh, so much bubbles. And how far away can you detect it? Can, so if you have such an underwater storage site and if it starts to leak, can you even detect it? This was one of the questions. And here you could see on the image before we deployed one of these sea guard instruments with CO2, oxygen, wa uh, wave and tide, salinity, temperature and currents and uh, not surprisingly we can see here the relation between the tides the blue one here is the tide and the release of CO2 uh, when tide is low pressure is low more CO2 comes out and but you could see that there were two instruments standing next to each other and sometimes one was showing these spikes and sometimes the other one was showing these high values and sometimes the other the other so it was very heterogeneous and it was much dependent on how water was moving. Um, another thing is that if you dive, if you're used to diving, you will see the bubbles, they will expand as you go up. In this case they don't, they, they disappear because they dissolve into the, into the water. <coughs> <coughs> and um, yes, uh, here you see the two instruments, two of the instruments standing next to each other, the sea guard here and another type of instrument developed at the University of Kyushu. One thing that we used here and uh, turned out to be uh, very useful was to use, to analyze the data, we used multivariate statistical methods. The multivariate statistical methods tells you, if you p input a lot of different measurement parameters, it will tell you which parameters are related, correlated or anti-correlated. And the multivariate statistical methods turned out to be a very effective way of distinguishing between when you have natural processes uh, and uh, the way this works is that if these two PCO2 and oxygen are, are on the opposite side and far away from each other, they are strongly anti-correlated as you, you have when you have natural processes. When you have CO2 leakage created by humans, there was not this strong anti-correlation. <coughs> so, um, I also want to show you um, uh, a couple of slides <laughs> from uh, surface water measurements and this is from a compact ferry box system, we call it SUGARD. It's a system we developed about two, yeah, three years ago. Here is one which has been running in the Baltic for the last two years about and uh, you can see it's going, it was going from Riga to Stockholm, now it's going from Tallinn to Stockholm. At the moment it's in the dock, the ferry, it will go out again in two weeks, I think. But uh, no, now it's going from Tallinn to Stockholm. So every day the ferry is going from Riga, was going from Riga to Stockholm, and the next day it's going from Stockholm to Riga. So every day you get these surface water measurements. And this is a very efficient way of getting information about, for example, um, we, at the moment, you can see what we are measuring are from the system. We are measuring temperature, salinity, oxygen concentration, chlorophyll, turbidity, particles, phycocyanin, which is a measure of blue-green algae, which is a big problem in the summer in the Baltic Sea, and PCO2. <coughs> With these parameters, you get more kind of scientific background information. What we are planning to do is to equip it also with oil, oil spill detection, because here is the major export of Russian oil going to Prevaltisk here and going through the Baltic Sea. So you can see here if there is, detect if there is oil spill. And we also plan to, to uh, uh, equip it with some device which can detect there, is a, there has been dumping in the Baltic Sea of a lot of uh, um, chemical weapons from the First World, First World War and also from the Second World War. And uh, there is talks about how much this will leak and if you can detect if they leak. We think that the ferry box in, is an ideal system to detect leakage from, uh, from underwater dumping sites of, of weapons, for example. And the data are uh, visible on the internet. They are recorded every minute and uh, it's color coded. You can see here uh, different colors mean different things. You can uh, see interrelation, you don't see it well here, interrelation between parameters like oxygen and PCO2. You can uh, look at ev any date or every, and you can download data from the internet. It's fully open. And the same type of system, it's a compact system, it's big like this, with a data logger which can take many types of different sensors. 
we are planning to use on this sail buoy, which has also been tested here off the Canary Islands. Uh, it's developed by a company in Bergen called Offshore Sensing. It's basically driving uh, by sail. It's like a wave glider, but it's less expensive and uh, more easy to deploy and probably more robust. And, uh, and you can equip it with sensor and let it go out for, for several months at a time. <laughs> uh, another uh, situation where uh, uh, PCU2 sensors, and this is as far as I know the first deployment ever or measurements ever of PCU2 from a, a glider uh, was done uh, by University of Bergen on one of their gliders. Uh, it's a, a Kongsberg glider. And uh, here you can see the transect it was doing. It was going from March till October and during that time it made 703 profiles to 1,000 meters along this transect. And if we look at the data, we can, it illustrates a little bit about issues you can have with, uh, with, with uh, this type of, of sensor. First, we should look at the oxygen, which is measured with our standard type of 4330 sensors here. Up track and down track cor correlate quite well. There is a limited resolution in how many data you points you send back. So that's why you get this kind of stepwise changes here. But for the PCU2, you see that the uh, ascent and the descent is significantly different, and this is because slow response time. So you get here a difference. There are ways of calculating and compensating for this, but yeah, uh, that's what we are working on, how to do that. Another thing you can notice here, if you know your carbon carbonate chemistry, is that values here are about 1,500 uh, or 1,000 1, uh, microatmospheres. It should be something like 300 and something in this area. So the sensor has drifted, and this is dive number 701, so after 700, 700 dives it has drifted. And, um, but we think this is a regular drift, and that in that case, if it's a regular drift, you can do some compensation for it. <coughs> People from uh, this university, from University of Las Palmas, Melkor and uh, participated in this uh, in this exercise here, which we did in Kolyfjord, where we recently did an instrument in the comparison of PCU2 and pH sensors within the frames of a European project named Fixo3. And here we compared uh, about 14 different sensors and uh, yeah, different technologies and different manufacturing sensors pH and PCO2, all focus on pH and PCO2. Here you can see uh, the system as it was deployed, a lot of, a mess of sensors and uh, different types of sensors and technologies. And here is uh, after recovery, that was quite high fouling in the fjord. So you can see everything is uh, kind of greenish. And um, we are now working on the results and uh, on a paper as well, trying to work on a paper. Here you can see examples of where anti-fouling worked well. Some sensors were not protected against fouling at all. Some were protected against fouling. For example, here is a wiper. This one here is a YSI EXO, which had both a copper guard and a wiper, which was efficient in protecting the sensor from, uh, from fouling. Here is a copper guard on a control sensor. Here is... Uh, uh, sensor which is unprotected, an ISFET sensor from Japan. This was the IYSI. Here's another one with a pump, so a PSI sensor with an inlet with a TBT. You know, TBT is prohibited and, uh, and toxic, but uh, it was used before as anti fouling paint. And uh, the reason it was an efficient anti fouling paint was that it to it's toxic. That's why you see it's clean at the inlet here. <coughs> <coughs> <clears throat> and here are other sensors which are quite much fouled and you can see uh, of course when you have fouling that affects your uh, your uh, your sensors and here are results from the PCO2 measurements um, I will not go into the details here you see how variable the PCO2 is in the fjord we take reference samples but with the re even if we take reference samples twice a week we don't 
we cannot say really which sensor is the most accurate and you can see at the end here how big the oscillations are on some sensors these are the sensors which are not well protected against fouling and finally <coughs> I will show you some results or one slide from or two slides from uh, the Institute of Marine Research where we are going doing some work together in their ocean acidification facility it's a facility where they have the ability to uh, expose organisms to different uh, different levels of uh, pH and look at the response of uh, ocean acidification and here we are measuring with our pH op optical pH sensors which we are working on now on development and here you see things like uh, we can see that uh, the reference data they take here are reference data they take every day uh, they typically have uh, a resolution of 300 of pH units but our, the sensors have a resolution of uh, less than one thousandth of a pH unit so here the sensors are much more <coughs> much higher resolution than uh, the reference data and this is a big problem in pH because it's you cannot really reference better the sensors have much better uh, resolution than, uh, than what you can do in your reference uh, data and here is an example of where they take samples from one day to the other indicates an increase of free pH units in the reference data but sensors, the pH sensors indicate that it's fairly stable and the same thing with the PCU2 optode on a reverse scale here indicates that it's also fairly stable so here it must be an error in the, in the sampling and uh, you, can, you can see here how difficult it, it is to really understand the carbonate system even in this completely controlled environment or co quite controlled environment you can see here for example in this case an increase in uh, pH of three thousands of pH units which is indicated by both pH optodes should lead according to calculations to an increase in PCO2 of five microatmospheres which is also the case here but you need really high resolution on your sensors <coughs> so with this I would like to thank you for uh, for coming here and for for listening I hope it was something useful So um, the the independent the studies which have been done on the stability of, of the sensors uh, there was one for example done by uh, people from uh, Scripps and from Embari in yeah, California <laughs> where they took data from uh, Argo flows and uh, compared deep water readings with the open ocean atlas. And uh, in that study, they concluded uh, that the average drift of the octodes, but you know, the deep water ocean atlas is so and so for referencing, but that the average drift of the, uh, of the octodes was 0 0.03, so 300 of a micromolar per year. per year. But then the standard deviation is plus minus 3, so it's, you know, it just drowns in the, in the noise there. Yeah. But there is on the longest deployments. Uh, in the field which, the, with, which we have examples of is, is on the Argo floats. They typically live for six, seven years now. And there, some people let them go up in the atmosphere. And in the atmosphere, you can get kind of approximate uh, reading of the stability. And uh, there is about 100 examples of where these sensors have been stable for more than six years in the water. But this depends on how quickly you sample your sensor because in the Argo floats you, you excite them, you sample them uh, maybe on average yeah, on average for the deployment maybe once every five minutes or so which is very low sampling frequency some people who run them, we know for example uh, on, uh, in aquaculture applications they run our sensors on, uh, on cameras Mm -hmm. where they put the sensor on a camera and they, the camera is used in the aquaculture application and they lower the camera to look at salmon in the fish farm and measure the oxygen at the same time. 
there uh, they cannot change the sampling interval, they just run them at two, two second interval. Mm -hmm. And there you have uh, a bleaching induced drift from, uh, from the ex excitation, which is something like 10% over one year. So, but the difference then is that you have, uh, uh, so, six million uh, measurements or something like that, compared to the total lifetime of the Argo float, which is maybe 20,000 measurements. So, but uh, the life, the foils becomes better and better over time. So, uh, the foils, the more you excite them, they, the less, there is a drift uh, depending on how much you excite them. But uh, the more you excite them, the better they become, the less the drift is. The drift is maybe, so a good foil, the drift is 0.05% for 100,000 excitations. And if you have a current meter outside in here for one year, typically you log it at 10 minute interval, you will never even see it. Uh, but uh, the problems you have, people have experienced with these sensors is mainly if you put them in the, in the storage, in the fluorescent light, mm. this seems to affect them, so you, then you can, without any protection, if you store them like that for, uh, for a year in a lab or so, then you can have some, the signal typically becomes lower by some percent. Mm. But you can compensate for that by having a air atmospheric reading and uh, an offset compensation. Mm -hmm. In our group we have at our university, the first batch of these sensors, we have about 50 of these octodes, and, uh, and uh, the first batch came in 2002. We used them on our bottom landers, and we have never changed the foils, but we checked them between expeditions, and we see that for the last six, seven years, there has been no drift in, uh, in the sensors. But we know that that one shows 5% low, this one shows 3% low, and that one shows 4% low, for example. So, yeah. so typically it's very, it's very stable. PCO2 is more difficult because PCO2, also once PCO2 is in the water, uh, they are, seem, in most, in 80% uh, of the deployments, they have been okay. In 20%, they just went crazy, and we don't know exact, almost, uh, sometimes we know why, but sometimes we don't know why. And uh, they cannot dry out, for example, you must keep them wet. If you let them dry out, the foil, uh, the foil is dead. So then you must change the foil and recalibrate. So it's more tricky with the...